and we're back hello everyone and welcome back to the 2022 epilepsy connect symposium i am still and again sarah klein the ceo of the epilepsy foundation of colorado wyoming and we are back for uh canine seizure detection with Dr. Ed Ma, who I'm delighted to introduce. Um, Dr. Ma uh, completed his neurology residency and epilepsy fellowship at the University of Colorado and became associate professor in the Department of Neurology there. He established the Brooke Gordon Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at Denver Health. He originally hails from the Gulf South and graduated from Louisiana State University School of Medicine in New Orleans and Rice University in Houston. He is currently the medical director for Hometown Neurodiagnostics, which is an ambul ambulatory in-home EEG service. He is double boarded in neurology and epilepsy, but has special interest in medication resistant epilepsies, neuromodulation for epilepsy, including VNS and RNS, as well as epilepsy surgical evaluations. Dr. Ma has been named a 5280 top doc, top doc in epileptology and neurology from 2012 through the present, so that is 10 years in a row. He is affiliated with the American Epilepsy Society, the Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado and Wyoming as an executive board member, and he is past president and a current member of the Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado Professional Advisory Board. It is my true delight to introduce and hand over the screen and microphone to Dr. Ma. Hello. Um, let's see. Can you uh, see my screen? We can indeed see your screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I'll be talking about uh, canine detection of epilepsy. <clears throat> Um, some uh, research that we've done over the last couple of years, and uh, I see that uh, Katie uh, is on on the uh, um, board as well, and so if she wants to jump in, I'd be happy to sort of uh, have her field some questions. Um, currently, I'm um, at the Denver Neurological Clinic, uh, affiliated with uh, Porter Hospital in Centura um, as uh, the epileptologist in that group, and uh, yes, if you have any questions, let me know. So, uh, we'll talk about an overview of uh, background of seizures and canine detection in, in the literature, very briefly. Uh, genesis of a theory, hypothesis testing, uh, then the eureka moment, verifying the finding, and then um, basically talk about, you know, why on earth uh, is this even a thing? So with regard to background in the literature, um, prior to the work that we did, uh, mostly the, the uh, literature was populated by anecdotes. People would report that their dogs would notify them anywhere from 15 seconds to a day, um, and these would be variably written up, uh, presented uh, on the news in video form, um, and not very scientifically uh, rigorously discussed. However, enough of these have sort of uh, come to light um, that, you know, it really started um, generating a lot of interest around it. <clears throat> but uh, for the patients of you out there, the reasons you may have run into resistance with your doctor in the past are primarily based on three papers that were all published in neurology um, <clears throat> at the same time. The first uh, was uh, Dr. Litt's paper of seizure prediction, statistics, and dogs, a cautionary tale. Uh, notice the spelling of tail. Uh, the second is pseudo seizure dogs. And the third was wag the dog, skepticism on seizure alert canines. And essentially the conclusions were there was not good data at all as of 2007. The dogs were likely cueing in on behavior or scent. And more concerningly, uh, the general consensus at the time was that um, the, seizure, uh, the seizure dogs themselves were promoting psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. And this was based on a few EMU studies in which uh, patients were allowed to bring their dog into the EMU. The dog would sort of begin to have some alerting behavior, and then the patient would have a non-epileptic seizure on uh, EEG. And so that was uh, basically the, the going position as of about 2007, uh, when I started my professional career as an epileptologist. 
but everyone also agreed that dogs are great for the mental health of the patient. And so we should continue to encourage that regardless of what kind of seizures the patient actually had. And so uh, the genesis of the theory, um, this is uh, Jennifer Arnold. She's the founder and CEO of Canine Assistance. You might know of her program and it's affiliated with, with uh, UCB. Uh, they've, um, uh, they're both in Georgia, uh, headquartered in Georgia and they, they um, have uh, enjoyed a lot of uh, sponsorship and support over the years from them. She's been in the field for 20 years. And again, those anecdotes just started to accumulate. And so she strongly began to suspect that the dogs truly were sort of keying in on probably scent. And so in 2016, um, the, the evidence in her mind was building so much that she decided to uh, approach a chemistry lab. This one in particular run by Kenneth Furton at the um, <clears throat> Florida International University. The reason she sought him out is that they are responsible for much of the foundational research surrounding bomb sniffing and drug sniffing dogs used by police, the United States Armed Forces, and search and rescue efforts around the world. And so a lot of the, the solid canine scent research uh, it has been done out of his lab. Their chemistry lab is focused on detecting and identifying unique volatile organic compounds given off by explosives, various drugs of abuse, and human remains. Uh, but without external research funding, uh, Canine Assistance collaborated with the Ferdin Lab uh, out of their own um, coffers and set out to identify a potentially unique volatile organic compound uh, or signature of epilepsy if one existed. She suspected it did, but they were not sure. So um, they actually partnered with the Epilepsy Foundation of Florida for volunteers, found 11 persons with epilepsy, uh, and then used another 11 control subjects and uh, performed map, <coughs> excuse me, gas chromatography studies, looking at the total volatile organic compound constituents of sweat, saliva, and breath samples from these 22 patients under normal conditions and as a seizure um, occurred. And uh, this graph here shows, unfortunately it's in black and white, uh, it's very pretty in color, all the different potential compounds seen uh, of these 20, of these 11 control uh, epilepsy patients and 11 control patients. <clears throat> so uh, bear with me here and the next slide might show a little bit more graphically. Um, what they did was they took a baseline profile consisted of the common VOCs, the volatile organic compounds in the 11 control subjects. I'll go backwards. So this group here, they took this, each one of their profiles and found the uh, sort of common uh, background uh, profile and called that the baseline. They did the same thing with the persons with epilepsy baseline. That's this group here and then subtracted them, assuming this was the baseline to see which volatile organic compounds were unique in this group. And so that was what they called the unique interictal volatile organic compounds in persons with epilepsy. Then what they did was they <clears throat> took epilepsy samples, I'm sorry, uh, seizure samples of the persons with epilepsy um, and subtracted out the interictal uh, profile, leaving what was left over were basically nine unique volatile organic compounds that were only seen in epilepsy patients, but not during the interictal time period, only during the seizure and, and immediate post-seizure time period. D does that all make sense? You can raise your hands. I can see some of you up there. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so that was the, the Eureka moment. Um, <clears throat> first, what they did, oh, let's go backwards. Um, these were the nine sort of mostly unpronounceable compounds. Um, the top three that I have here in bold were the highest concentration. And this is essentially what became the standard seizure scent that the dogs were trained on. Um, and the only one that's, you know, remotely pronounceable are these two here. <laughs> All right. So what they did then was they, because these are pure compounds, they went to the shelf and pulled out menthol, methyl acetate, and 3-ethoxy-3,7-dimethyl-1,6-octadiene and blend them into a standard seizure scent. That's this. Second, this scent was then imprinted on four canine assistance dogs. 
So they learned how to identify this particular uh, compound uh, through a, a pretty standard training process, which if you'd like, I can find the video that um, Jennifer has out there, or, or you could probably even find it yourself. Uh, if you just Google um, uh, uh, canine training, uh, Jennifer Arnold, I think you'll probably see the video. A third, the dogs correctly identified the imprinted standard, that's this one, the seizure scent, from a multiple choice paradigm in, in which the dogs were presented five different scents. One of which included a interictal, a non-seizure sample of somebody with epilepsy, okay? Fourth, three, uh, I'm sorry, that's uh, this, I'm sorry. Fourth, three new dogs were imprinted on the ictal sample from the same person in test three. So this person, this person with epilepsy provided an ictal sample and an, and an interictal sample. These four dogs did not identify their scent in the interictal sample of this person. However, three separate dogs who've never seen anything were trained on the ictal smell of this same person. Does that make sense? You raise your hands? Okay. Then, and this is where it's kind of fun, these three dogs were then presented with this sample up here, the standard sample, and they recognized it as their seizure scent, suggesting that the ictal sample from this person with epilepsy was the same smell to the dogs as the standard scent that had been created from the, the original group of patients from the Epilepsy Foundation of, of um, Florida. Okay, so this is kind of just a, a revisitation of ninth grade math. If you remember geometry, if A equals B, B equals C, then A equals C, that's how we sort of got to this place. Does that all make sense? Is everyone on board? Okay. If I start to lose you, it's, let me know. I'll go back. <laughs> You're also welcome to read the whole paper. <laughs> I try to sort of make it a little bit easier. Uh, but this is really sort of science in action. You know, an interesting observation is made. Patients keep reporting that their dogs can warn them of seizures. And then you sort of form a hypothesis. Well, dogs have such sensitive noses. I, I wonder if they are reacting to a change in scent in the person with epilepsy. Then what you want to do is reformulate it as a null hypothesis so you can test it. So that changes to the scent of, a, of sweat of a person having a seizure is no different to a dog's keen sense of smell than the sweat from someone not having a seizure. And then you test that. Uh, so what they did was they identified the volatile organic compounds uniquely associated with the seizure samples, create a pure standard scent, train the dogs to identify the standard scent, and then train a second group of dogs to identify the seizure sweat from a person with epilepsy. This is just that, that whole last uh, slide that I talked about. And then see if the second group of dogs can recognize the standard scent, even though they've never smelled the standard scent before, and they did that. So the conclusion is, since the dogs can distinguish a seizure scent sample from a choice of other non-seizure samples, the null hypothesis is rejected. And we can conclude that dogs are able to detect something unique in seizure sweat. And part two, furthermore, since the seizure sweat sample is indistinguishable from the fabricated standard scent to a dog, these scents are identical. And we can infer that what is unique in seizure sweat are the components used to make the standard scent. Okay, does that make sense? <laughs> All right. So um, this work actually earned uh, um, a, a PhD candidate in Dr. Ferton's lab, his, his doctorate. So we get to call uh, Philip uh, Dr. Davis. Uh, again, just to remind, he did this part here. This was Jennifer and this was Philip. Okay, and so that sort of brings us to Colorado. We wanted to verify the findings. I heard about uh, this, uh, this uh, presentation at the AES uh, back in 2017. Uh, Jennifer was talking about it and I just happened to walk by and I'm just fascinated uh, by the subject and it was just a um, rat. Um, by the end of the talk, I walked up, introduced myself and said, I want to, to, to prove that this is correct prospectively. And so we did that. Uh, Jennifer and I had several lengthy discussions to design a prospective, believable canine scent study that would be accepted and put the concept of pseudo-seizure dogs to rest. So part one, we collected samples from the epilepsy monitoring patients 
randomly collected during each daily shift, as well as following the onset of a clinical or electrographic seizure. And then in part two, after we sort of started really uh, seeing um, so some interesting results from part one, we wanted to see yeah, but um, <clears throat> interictal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we took sweat samples from intracranial epilepsy monitoring units. And the intent was to, to do a high density collection, not just randomly throughout the day or with each shift, but every hour so that we can track when the seizures were actually um, coming with when the scent was really present. And we did this in the intracranial group. Uh, if anyone doesn't know, you know, uh, one of our, our primary functions as epileptologists is hopefully to identify a, a surgical lesion and uh, cure that person's epilepsy if possible uh, through epilepsy surgery. And we do that by putting electrodes inside the brain to really finely localize uh, where the seizures are coming from. So the assumption is that one, if these people are, you know, contemplating brain surgery, uh, they've got really frequent epilepsy. And if we pull them off medications, we're very, very likely to capture seizures. And so from a Monday to a Friday stay, the likelihood that I capture seizures in an intracranial case is very, very high, as opposed to a scalp case or phase one case uh, where it's sort of hidden miss. So sweat samples were collected by Katie, who I think is also listening. I saw her jump on the call. Uh, our research coordinator. She labeled each sweat sample, logged the sample in a database, prepared each sample in an airtight, no light, vacuum sealed pouch, and then mailed the samples to canine assistants in Georgia. The canine testing team were completely blind to subject characteristics and date and time of the sample. So uh, once these uh, bag samples landed in Georgia, they were brought to Jennifer uh, and they used the database that Katie um, uh, created. Jennifer would then present each scent sample to her team of dogs, usually three to five at a time, because they kind of get tired after a while, uh, for a simple yes or no response. She would present the scent uh, to the dog, and then the dog would signal, yes, this is my scent, no, this isn't my scent. And it was very um, a binary response. It was kind of uh, a nice, clean piece of data for the most part. Uh, these results were tabulated based on de-identified Colorado patient database provided by Katie. As the principal investigator, I was blinded to the data collection, that was Katie's part, as well as the canine responses, that's Jennifer's part. My sole data handling duty was to interpret the EMU EEG study to mark true epileptic seizures. Katie would then mesh the canine response data against the date and timestamps of the seizures that I identified in the EMU admission to create a table of true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives. This triple blinding would ensure that none of the data points would affect the results of the other investigators. So from uh, 2018 to 2020, uh, we uh, collected 60 unique subjects who agreed to participate in the study. Uh, amazingly, it wasn't 100%, and I have no idea why. You know, If you're gonna be laying in bed for a week, why not have a dog come around um, and uh, participate in, in this kind of research? But no, it wasn't 100%. Um, but 55 subjects in part one in the phase one study and 10 subjects in part two in the intracranial phase two study uh, with five subjects overlapping who were both in part one and part two. Um, this is uh, kind of small, I'm not sure you're able to see it, um, but you can see the N is 60 here. The average age was almost 40. Uh, it was a pretty even gender mix. Um, the the meds they were on, which is sort of a sign of how bad their seizures were, they averaged between two and three drugs, 25 and 11 here. And one thing that we'll come back to later, um, focal seizures were seen in 43 subjects, generalized epilepsy in five. So aim number one from this first study, prospectively confirm that seizure sense sensitized dogs can accurately discriminate an epileptic seizure sample from an interictal sample. So the dog's probability of detecting a seizure scent in the ictal window, which we defined as 90 minutes before a true seizure to 90 minutes after a true seizure, uh, or not detecting a seizure scent in the ictal window is up to 93.7%. The dog's ability to identify seizure sweat has a sensitivity of 65%, specificity of 88%, positive predictive value of 83%, negative predictive value of 74%. Uh, that's this comes from this table here. 
aim number two. Assess whether non-epileptic seizures are also associated with the unique seizure set. Seven of the 12 subjects with suspected NES, or non-epileptic seizures, had at least one captured and documented non-epileptic event during their EMU admission. Of the 39 total samples attributed to these 12 subjects, 19 were collected during an NES event in that defined window. Um, <clears throat> and 18 of the 19 observations, 94.7%, did not have that set. And so, you know, the, the caveat is that uh, some persons with non epileptic seizures also have both. And so, um, you know, again, the data is not entirely clear. It's not 100% either way, but it's a very strong suggestion that non epileptic seizures are not associated uh, with this unique seizure set. Aim number three investigate whether or not the unique seizure set precedes seizure onset or only exists in the ictal post ictal time period. In part two of the study, data collection every hour during the subject's intracranial EMU, eight subjects had sweat data collected in association with the seizure. The dog's probability of detecting an epileptic seizure during the ictal window was 71.2%, and the dog's probability of not detecting an epileptic seizure during the inner ictal window was 92%, uh, yielding a sensitivity of 72%, specificity of 91%, um, et cetera. And so that's uh, very compelling data as well. So a predictive positive set, this is the interesting piece, a predictive positive set was observed in 59 of the 75 seizures, or almost 80%, taken from the 106 samples collected within the 90 minutes prior to an actual seizure event. This probability of dog detecting a seizure set before the actual seizure is 82%. Uh, the warning range varied from 6 to 177 minutes. Average range about 68.2 minutes. And the duration of the post ictal scent tail after the seizure was over lasted from nine minutes to 123 minutes, the average being about 81. So, our study confirmed the seizure scent identified by canine assistants in Florida International University as potentially unique to epilepsy was identifiable, uh, excuse me, identifiable prospectively in persons with epilepsy during their seizure and not between seizures. Additionally, this unique epileptic seizure scent was not present during non-epileptic seizures. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the epilepsy seizure scent appeared to precede the majority of EEG EMU capture seizures by a considerable amount of time. 68 minutes of warning would allow many therapeutic or logistical safety interventions. Okay, so with a warning like that, an hour before a seizure, what could you do? You know, this is, this is fantastic news, if, if true and verified. Uh, you could drive. You know, if you got your, uh, your, your scent warning and you're on the interstate, uh, you have, you know, roughly an hour to pull over, which would be easy to do in most situations. You probably even end up your, at your next town or, or back at home. Um, this would, you know, for the most part, allow you to, to safely maneuver a vehicle. You could take a rescue medication to prevent the seizure from even happening in the first place. Um, pop an out of van, you know, take a nap, call it good. You could trigger an alarm to wake you up out of sleep to take an emergency action and likely lower your own suit at risk. If the descent were triggered while you're sleeping, wake you up again, take some out of van, do some other maneuver, um, and hopefully prevent the seizure from even happening. That would be amazing. You could rule out epilepsy mimics. Uh, like non-epileptic seizures, as I noted above. And you could really study epileptogenesis. Can you imagine uh, how high quality the imaging studies would be if you knew when the seizure was going to happen? And of course, there are always skeptics. Um, so what are the VOCs? What are the volatile organic compounds anyway? Why would your body generate these VOCs? We don't even know about them. Why would it do that? How do you know that the VOCs are even produced in the body? And these are all real questions from a potential um, investor um, as this, uh, this technology is being um, moving forward to uh, develop it. So menthol, this is the first of those agents uh, and the only really pronounceable one. Um, sounds like menthol, you know, turns out because they're related, it comes from peppermint. So why would your body produce a plant-based VOC in response to a seizure? 
But more importantly, why would your body produce a plant-based volatile organic compound at all? It turns out there's no literature evidence of menthol biosynthesis in humans. A little bit of a problem if you're trying to get people to uh, uh, believe your research. So this is the biosynthetic pathway of menthol uh, <clears throat> as here, and this is menthol. And I don't know if you recognize any of these guys here, but you might, and I'll show you why. So um, as with every um, initial question, Dr. Google, actually gave me a clue. An interesting paper from 1987 found that if you crush a bug called Tyrophagus similis, then all the neighboring mites of only the same species run away from that dead buddy. If you then drop that crushed mite into a test tube of hexane, shake it around, you can extract a compound that when purified can produce the same escape behavior without having to kill one of these mites. That substance is isopiperentinone, and in this example, would be classified as an alarm pheromone. Big deal. What's the connection? Well, isopiperentinone happens to be right here. Okay. Does anyone see the interesting thing about that? So if you notice, we didn't jump just within a phylum. We jumped from kingdom plantae to kingdom animalia. We went from a plant-based compound to an animal-based compound. So plant and animal alarm pheromones, what are these? There's another alarm pheromone called E-beta farnesine used by aphids to signal danger. And like the mite, species-specific aphids will stop eating and drop off a plant when they smell this pheromone. Interestingly, a species of potato plant will use this plant-derived version of E-beta F to fend off feeding aphids. So, so let's listen to that again. A plant has adapted the use of an animal alarm pheromone through its very own unique biosynthetic machinery to protect itself. So it is possible for a VOC thought to be produced by plants to also be produced by animals. It is a big phylogenetic jump though from insects to humans, but it raises the possibility. So do you recognize these things? IPP, DMAP, geranial diphosphate. Well, it happens to be part of the human biosynthetic pathway to create cholesterol. You go through this pathway here, and you go to IPP, DMAP, geranial phosphate, squalene, and to cholesterol. And if you recognize these letters, H, M, G, CoA, this is where statins sort of lower your cholesterol by blocking this pathway here. So really all you need is an enzyme. All of this already exists. All you need is this enzyme to walk you down this pathway. And I'm hypothesizing that even though there's no literature evidence of it, it must be there. So science in action two. Interesting observation. Menthone is related to a plant alarm pheromone and is also part of a unique human seizure sense. So let's form the hypothesis. Is the VOC actually a human alarm pheromone? So let's reformulate that as a null hypothesis. Dogs trained to identify menthone in seizure sweat cannot distinguish between fear scented sweat and sweat collected under other conditions. Let's test this. In part one, proof of concept, we collected sweat from control subjects. And this was fun. No history of epilepsy under two different conditions. First, they got to watch the movie Airplane. And, while wa and then while watching the movie It. So uh, we collected sweat at 15 minutes prior to the movie start, between 30 and 15 minutes into the movie, and 15 minutes after the movie ended. Movies were watched as a cohort, everyone in the same group, in the same room, at the same temperature. <clears throat> in part two, we used a multiple choice paradigm. Uh, 11 different subjects. Each subject collected one fear-provoked sweat sample, because we knew we could do it based on part one, a baseline sample, just doing nothing, a five minute exercise sample, they jogged in place. And then for each subject, an additional two sweat samples were provided from a sample um, uh, person with epilepsy, or I'm sorry, from the same person with epilepsy uh, undergoing intracranial EEG. One, while it was a, a, an interictal sweat sample, and two, an ictal or a seizure sweat sample from the same patient. And so what that means is each subject 
of these 11 in part two had six samples for the dog team to smell. One was fear, one was baseline, one was exercise, one was interictal, not the same person, one was ictal, not the same person, and then just a blank swab. Results. So five subjects participated in our proof of concept study. And in four of the five subjects, the dog scent detection team identified fear sweat as their seizure sweat um, <clears throat> with uh, no identification of seizure sweat during uh, the non-fear exposure trials watching airfit. And I'll show you that graph of that means. In part two, 11 subjects participated. The dogs identified samples of either fear or seizure as their seizure scent with a sensitivity of 0.82 and a specificity of 1.0. There were no false positive detections. This means the dogs had a 92, and I'm sorry, excuse me, but the dogs also had a 90%, a 92% inner rater agreement uh, in their detections. So all the dogs agreed with each other and there were no false positives. It was a very uh, highly correlated uh, study. So this is the, the uh, part one data. And these are the five subjects. And these are the sweat samples associated with the movie It and with the movie Airplane. And they're sort of stacked on top of each other. If you notice, these are the four dogs and their names. Um, none of the airplane sweat samples smelled like seizure. OK, but if you look at it during and it after, many of them did. They, these dogs could not distinguish between the seizure scent that they had been trained on and the fear sweat that we had presented to them. So in conclusion, dogs trained to identify menthone in seizure sweat correctly identified fear scented sweat apart from blank baseline exercise and interictal sweat samples. Therefore, the null hypothesis is rejected, and we can conclude that fear-scented sweat is different from those other conditions. Furthermore, as the dogs were not trained specifically to recognize fear-scented sweat, and because they identified both fear sweat and seizure sweat as their seizure-scented sweat, we may also conclude that fear sweat and seizure sweat smell the same to the dog detection team. If you recall from the original paper, the seizure scent was not part of the non- persons with epilepsy group or the interictal persons with epilepsy volatile profiles. But in this study, we provoked the scent in a non-PWE population. These results support the idea that the circuit that produces this scent is native to humans in general and not specific to persons with epilepsy. And this obviously makes sense. This network is common to both focal and genetic generalized seizures. That was a graph that I showed you before. There were both groups in our EMU study from the first paper and that the network is likely involved in fear perception and fear response. And uh, this is the, um, <clears throat> the image uh, of the abstract of, of that second paper. Uh, both of them showed up in epilepsy and behavior. Um, both I had time to write during COVID since our EMU was shut down. <laughs> OK, and uh, these are the dogs from the first study. Um, Butch being the grandfather of everybody. Um, his nose is incredible. Unfortunately, I think he's since passed. Um, but he's, uh, yeah, it, it, he really allowed us to, to uh, highlight and showcase the ability that these dogs have. All right, do you have any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Ma. This was um, fascinating. And um, I know everybody particularly loves the pictures of the dogs as well as the information you had to share. Um, I'm going to go through the chat and um, just ask a few of the questions that have come across in the chat, and I'm sure there will be some other uh, ones to come, but I'll just start back what I think is at the beginning. Sure. Um, so there was a question about um, whether there were different VOC profiles for the longer warning times that could be determined. That is a great question. Um... Again, because of the way in which we um, winnowed down the data, um, I, I don't think that I can really answer that. that the short answer is there's no answer. Um, but that would be something to, um, to look you know, at again when these kinds of studies are uh, reproduced. And that, that is sort of the hope of getting this study published and sort of outlining what we did 
so that other groups can verify this. And then the follow-up is, is there any plan to translate this into prediction? Yes. Um, actually, the reason the second paper came about was because the, uh, the group that sort of evolved from the first paper and the results of the first paper um, are looking to translate that into a medical device. And they were looking for investors uh, to, uh, to help with that. And so a lot of the initial questions that we didn't have answers for, um, you know, essentially in, in this talk anyway, became that second paper. Um, so this idea that peppermint showed up as a scent, um, you know, one person was like, well, how do we know that they're not all, you know, using the same toothpaste? It's like, well, first of all, this was identified in 11 uh, patients in Florida and then re-verified by 60 patients in Colorado. Um, so yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> but at the same time, I couldn't support that with literature. And, then, and that's what sort of got me sort of down the rabbit hole of thinking about where on earth is this set coming from? Right. And then, I, and then I found the bug paper. So if you were to train a dog, a specific dog, would you need the sweat from a specific patient to train a specific dog? Uh, that's a great question. And I think, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm both happy that this data is out there, but at the same time, we have to be careful that it's not overly generalized. Um, my, my opinion is that, you know, if you are able to catch a dog at a, a very sort of, you know, early time and train, train that dog well, uh, they should be able to identify that person's seizure scent, you know. Uh, the question is not even so much the training of the dog, because that's the easy part. Dogs smell, you know, um, their ability to scent um, is on, on parts per trillion, you know. So the, the device that's attempting to be created um, can scent down to parts per billion. Um, but if we give it specific enough data with specific enough parameters, we can kind of um, mimic the dog's accuracy. But the dogs are incredibly sort of sensitive to these things. You know, we walk into a room and we smell something. The dogs walk into a room because they can tell how much part, how many particles they can send. They actually have directional smell. So we have ears that are separated. So when we hear something, we know which direction that sound came from. Their noses are so sensitive and they can smell out of each nostril. They can tell where a scent is coming from stronger than the other. And they, they can hone in on a specific direction for scent where we can't do that. Um, so yeah, it's, I guess the, you know, the short answer is probably yes, but your ability to understand the dog's communication back with you is the key. Right. And we got a couple of questions around, is it possible to train my current dog? Are there some breeds that are better than other dogs? So what, what are your thoughts around um, sort of how this, your research in this study applies to kind of, you know, our own dogs and our sort of specific situations? How do we translate, does this translate into um, sort of like our lives and our families and our dogs and stuff right now? Yeah. Uh, again, I think the short answer is probably in some cases, you know, it depends on how well you can train the dog to communicate back with you. You know, um, if you present your seizure sweat and say, this is my, my, this is my seizure, um, the dog will know. Okay. But can you train the dog to teach you or to communicate back with you? And are you in tune enough with the dog to listen to the cues that the dog is giving to you? And does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The, the dogs are smart. We're just not often paying attention. <laughs> we don't speak their language, right? We don't speak their language well. Yeah. Um, okay, another question. It seems as though the focus has been on menthone. If the mm -hmm. profile was more complex, could sensitivity be increased? Yes, yes. And, and that's what the, the device is looking at. Uh, menthone was just the easiest piece to, to, to grab onto because, like I said, it's spellable and pronounceable. <laughs> so, so you can find, you know, you can search it easily, you know, more easily than these, you know, uh, 95 letter sort of names. Um, but yes, you know, with 
with the three compounds identified and maybe even asking for more, uh, we can you know, probably more accurately uh, hone in on that. And those are all sort of for studies down the road. We just need somebody to repeat this. The questions are just pouring in, so I'm asking them as fast as I can. Sorry, was there <laughs> talk faster than I thought? We have like 20 minutes if you got yeah, all kinds of time. Was yeah. there patient overlap from the first study to the second? Were some of the patients from the first study used for the fear based study? Uh, no, no, the fear based study had no persons with epilepsy in it. Um, can other individual VOP for other patients be more dominant than the menthone, thus creating a different smell other than the peppermint scent? Um, of course it's possible. We didn't see that. Like I said, at the very beginning, um, with Philip's work, uh, they took the baseline and averaged the baseline group and assumed that that was, you know, what, you know, quote, non-epilepsy patients smell like. <laughs> Again, they only had 11. If they had, uh, if they had 1,000, it probably would have been more accurate, okay? Um, but that was a, a ton of data and uh, two years worth of work for this poor guy. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we used that as the baseline um, and then we got the epilepsy patients and then sort of subtracted that out. What was left over were these unique groups. And then we took those same patients with seizures when they didn't have seizure, compared that sweat and subtracted that out and what fell out were those nine VOCs. Uh, so we have a clarifying question. Um, to clarify, can a dog be successful without the clothing or sweat of a seizure patient? I'm sorry, uh, could you repeat that again? Yeah, it says, can a dog be successful without the clothing of a seizure patient? The clo uh, what do you mean the clothing? Um, so I guess I didn't go into the detail because um, I wanted to keep it sort of very general for, for the audience. Um, but what we, what they, what the first group did, what Phillips uh, and Dr. Ferton's uh, laboratory did, was they looked at sweat from the armpit with a basically kind of a clean cotton towel and then put it into a baggie. Uh, spit, they spat into a, um, a, a test tube. Um, and then they breathed into a bag uh, that also had a, a cotton, a stale cotton uh, in there and then sealed it. And so they looked at all three. Of the three, the reason uh, Jennifer and I chose sweat was that it was just easier to collect, you know, uh, at the time. So obviously spit is pretty easy, but you have to wait for the patient to wake up. And we wanted to be able to capture the seizure as it was happening, if possible. And so um, th that was the, 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 you know, the bio sample that required the least amount of cooperation, if you will. Um, and so we, in the epilepsy monitoring unit, would use a sterile swab, swab underneath the armpits, <laughs> and then put it into a test tube. And then Katie would process it by removing it in a sterile fashion, clipping it off into a electro sealed darkened pouch, zip it, and then heat seal the top. And so it would trap any sort of odor inside there. Uh, only to be released whenever Jennifer opened it and cut the top off the heat seal. So, so it was it was stable uh, in you know hot Atlanta's you know airport um, because there was nowhere for the VOCs to go. They were trapped inside that little pouch. Um, is any of the, uh, this study being implemented in dog training now for people with epilepsy? or the dogs that are um, being trained right now, are they being trained you know, in other ways? Do you have any idea about that? I don't have a good sense of that. I, I do know that Jennifer um, is doing you know, some of that work uh, back, back home in Georgia. Um, yeah, yeah. So every now and then she'll ask me for fresh samples of epilepsy. <laughs> To, to train a new uh, a graduating class um, that they're sort of constantly producing. Um, but yeah, um, I don't think at this moment they're using uh, uh, the laboratory standards, you know, out of the glass jar kind of standards right now. I think they're, they're still using the sweat samples that we're providing. Do you know if there were any major differences between identification of focal seizures versus generalized seizures? Yeah, so that's a great question. I sort of alluded to it at the end and sort of mentioned it at the beginning. Um, but here, 
Um, so in the epilepsy monitoring unit, this is the first study, we had 43 focal patients, five generalized patients. And again, in most epilepsy monitoring units, you're not going to get a ton of generalized epilepsy because you're, you're not really mystified about the diagnosis and you're unlikely to, uh, to do surgery on them. So we don't really tend to stick a lot of generalized epilepsy patients in the EMU on purpose. Um, but over a two-year time period, uh, a couple got through or a couple actually had both, focal and generalized epilepsy. Um, a follow-up study that I would love to do would be to intentionally admit generalized epilepsy patients into the, into the EMU for the sole purpose of, of uh, sweat collection. Well, and verification scenario. Yeah. Speaking of your um, kind of chart here, we, we do see a couple of comments about uh, maybe some delay in the progression of slides earlier. Um, just so people know, this is being recorded, so you can absolutely go back and listen to this again with the slides, um, hopefully, uh, that are tracking with Dr. Ma's presentation. So I know there's, he's covered a lot of information and there's a lot to look at and to, to read through. So you can always listen to it again and um, try to absorb the, the you know, huge amounts of data that he's gone through because there, I know there's a lot to, um, to, try to, to try to learn here. So uh, I think that was all the questions that came through in the chat. Is there any other questions that anyone has for Dr. Ma? Any other cute dog pictures we can see? Uh, <laughs> not that I have to do that. <laughs> I've got a ton of my phone. We, we probably all do. Yeah, no, the, uh, the canine team came up several times um, to both understand what we were doing in our epilepsy monitoring unit, um, but also to see if we could, in a real-time way, have the, the dogs walk into the epilepsy patient room. Um, but it was so, so hit and miss. It didn't seem like a great use of their time although Jennifer did enjoy coming to Colorado um, uh, the four or five times she did. Great. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Does anyone want to see any different slides that maybe I blew through too quickly? I mean, I think the, this is the take home from the first paper and probably the most meaningful. And, you know, why I hope some other groups try to replicate this. Uh, one other question. I don't know if it was mentioned, but can a dog detect quick myoclonic seizures? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's a great question, but you know, the, the myoclonic seizure itself is so clinical, you know, um, and it's so brief. Even if you were to get a warning an hour ahead of time, let's assume that you did. Um, it's unclear what you would do to prevent something that lasts less than, you know, a, a quarter to a third of a second. Now, if the myoclonic jerk sort of accelerated into a big clonic seizure, that, that would be something. Um, and so, again, I think because I only have five generalized epilepsy patients in the group, um, I don't know that we would be able to know that yet without repeating that portion of the study with more generalized epilepsy patients, which is, again, I mentioned I, I want to do. Yeah, no, th this study, as fun as it was, probably created way more questions than it answered. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to explore each of those, uh, each of those facets. And if you guys have ideas about questions to ask, uh, let me know. I'd love to collaborate. Okay, well, I think we've had all of our questions answered. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Ma, for your presentation. This is fascinating and 
dogs are always a popular topic. So um, we appreciate your time and sharing this uh, really um, fascinating research. And uh, obviously everyone is, is really interested to see where this goes and to see, um, yeah, Dr. Park has mentioned, it's, it'd be interesting to see the same in pediatric patients for sure. Um, so uh, I think with that, we will, um, we will wrap up this presentation. We've got 10 minutes before our next session, which will be the genetics of epilepsy with Dr. Kristen Park. So we will let everyone take a quick break before we um, come back on at one o'clock. So thank you, Dr. Ma. Um, thanks everyone for your uh, great questions and attendance. And we will see you back here in 10 minutes. Thank you all so much.